Hey, it's Jay. I've been keeping a secret from you this season. The song you're hearing right now, it wasn't written by a human. It's computer generated. And so has just about every piece of music I've used thus far in the season, including this one. And this one. And this one. They're all built slightly differently. Some of them are generated from absolutely nothing but a random mathematical seed. Some are generative and take a small sequence of notes and build out a kind of, you know, fractoral patterns. Some try to emulate the style of certain composers, but um, yeah, they're all computer generated. So here's the question I want to ponder. Are these pieces of music art? Do they perhaps downgrade from art to mere imitation of art when you learn that the emotions you may have felt when you heard it were not intentionally guided by an intelligent human hand? Is it even worse than that? Are they now officially like tricks? Have I harmed you somehow by using them to elicit emotions in perhaps something like the travel episode that I did with Emily Thomas? There's no shortage of philosophical inquiries throughout history into the question of what art is. And frankly, a lot of it's pretty difficult stuff. Philosophers have gone to great lengths trying to characterize the conditions which must be present for art to be happening. I find most of these endeavors to be dead ends and pretty boring, but I think there is something to Immanuel Kant's effort. So here's his stab at what art is. This is Immanuel Kant. Art is a kind of representation that is purposive in itself and, though without an end, nevertheless promotes the cultivation of the mental powers for sociable communication. That's really it. So I think there's two useful concepts in Kant's definition which seem to contradict. Kant says that it must be purposive in itself, but also without an end. Can something be purposive but have no end? Do those two ideas cancel each other out? Did Kant not notice this? Well, Kant was pretty clever, so he probably did. And I think this definition captures my personal sense of art as well. So it has a purpose, but no end. So what is that purpose then? I, I really have no idea, but here's why I think this paradox matters so much and why the human condition is forever handcuffed to this oxymoron. Considering the ends of any activity is ultimately an effort to answer a why question. Why questions are notoriously frustrating. Children often discover this and go through a, a why phase where they pepper their parents with the word why no matter what the given explanation is. It might sound something like this. Why are your eyes blue? Well, because my parents both had blue eyes. Why? Because their parents passed on genes which cause blue eyes, I guess. Why? Because some random mutation in human evolution resulted in blue eyes and the mutation was beneficial enough to be selected for and passed on into future generations. Why? <laughs> because blue eyes were thought to be attractive, I suppose. Why? I don't know. Shut up. You know how these kind of conversations go. I often think that asking a why question is usually asking a question that would be better phrased as how did it come to be that blank? And even more specifically, something like starting with the blind process of universal Darwinism given as a fundamental law of the universe we find ourselves in, how did it come to be that you have blue eyes? <laughs> Good luck training your eight-year-old to ask questions like that. So why did I just go down this rabbit hole of genetic evolution and questions of why? I think to tackle the question of art, it's important to keep these concepts of causal chains in mind. I want you to think of these chains as something like being a slave to things with other purposes in mind than yours. So the genes want to get to the next generation. They have their motivation. And you, and when I say you, I mean the illusion of self, you are a slave to those motivations. I don't mean to degrade the motivations of genes. They may cause us to do incredibly beautiful and kind things. We might make 
a beautiful garment that signals to the community in a way that makes us more attractive. Ultimately, the genes are pretty happy that they are increasing their chances of making it to the next generation. But are there behaviors and activities which can hope to escape this deterministic slavery? Is there something that a creature can do which rebels against the relentless slave master of genetic evolution? In an upcoming episode with Susan Blackmore, we ponder a mimetic framing which might supersede even this conversation about genetics, but let's set that aside for now. I'm trying to think of activity which seeks to find our cosmic bearings, to step outside of the stream of evolution and address an existential moment, to make a statement about the human condition, either profound or small. So consider this kind of bizarre thought experiment I dreamed of. Think of a much talked about famous exhibit, Marcel Duchamp's Fountain. For those unfamiliar, this was an exhibit which consisted of an ordinary porcelain urinal with the words R. Mutt scribbled on it, displayed in 1917 at the Society of Independent Artists at the Grand Central Palace in New York. So, just a urinal. Did this act of displaying a urinal have purpose? Did the statement of putting it in an art show imbue it with a purpose? Was there an end to Duchamp's activity which could be explained by genetic forces? Was this an artistic act? I think it was, or at least it was a kind of effort to rebel against the slave master of evolution and comment on the absurdity of our human condition. Of course, one could tell a genetic story here that the act itself somehow was Duchamp seeking status and fame and therefore sex, and in the end the genes were still driving the show, but the effort, however silly, was there. So now imagine you are observing behavior in birds of paradise. These birds perform elaborate mating rituals where the males clear an area like a stage and perform these amazing dances and hop around displaying bright colors for the females. If you haven't seen them do this, fire up YouTube and enjoy, it's just incredible. Would these dances qualify as a kind of art? I'm not so sure because the ends of this expensive spending of energy is easily explained by genetic factors. The bird's genes want to make it to the next generation and therefore must find a female who has genes they can mix with and encode into a baby bird of paradise. If the genes are to succeed, they better do a darn good dance and advertise how awesome they are. But imagine you witnessed a bird of paradise sitting on its stage preparing to dance, but instead it folds its wings and lays a tree branch with bird droppings on it on the forest floor. A true Marcel Duchamp of birds. Let's say the female birds don't find this very attractive and this bird does not mate, yet it continues to perform the same display over and over again. A genetic explanation might simply call this a mistake or wrong turn of a mutation of behavior which clearly won't make it to the next generation. Uh, it's clearly a waste of energy, resources, and it's maladaptive. But is this bird actually an artist? Now, we don't really observe these kinds of behaviors in animals like birds. They tend to have all of their actions or most of their actions explained by genetic forces and evolution. They don't step out of that stream of causal behavior. We do, however, begin to see things like what I'm talking about in higher primates and elephants, especially elephants, which perform morning rituals where they cover fallen elephants with grass and gently nudge their bones. Uh, I'll reiterate that genetics and evolutionary psychology has this near totalitarian way of couching all of this behavior as still ultimately being slave to the genes. They simply would call the elephant behavior at a morning ritual as pro-social behavior, and perhaps an elephant who doesn't perform the morning ritual is shunned by the community and therefore less likely to procreate. And of course, the genes then are not so happy. So sure, those explanations are always available. And perhaps it is why the ultimate philosophical question of art is so hard to pin down. But I think there is something to this, to return to Kant's definition. A purpose is there to the act of creating the art, but the end must not so easily fall in line with the tyranny of genetic motivation. So there's a pretty thick introduction for you. I want to point out that everything I just wrote pretty much ponders the act of art from the artist's point of view. 
And there is an entirely different question as to the receiver of the art. If one receives the art and is thrust into an existential wonderment of his or her place in the cosmos, does this then make the instigator of that thought an object of art, even if it is simply a urinal? Well, that's enough of me. Here's a conversation with an incredibly accomplished artist who goes by the moniker Swoon. We dance around all these thoughts and more while discussing some of her most recent work and all the while ponder what art is. And if this sound you are hearing right now might qualify as art, even though there seems to be no intention about it, perhaps it is the most artistic because it is refusing to have an end qualified by genetics. Oh. And I'll also mention that we talk in detail about one of her recent installations uh, called Swoon, the Canyon Medea, which you might want to take a look at while we're discussing it. So I'll link to photographs of it in the podcast description. So here you go. Season two, episode nine. What is art with Swoon? Enjoy. I have a lot of notes, so we'll see where it goes. But if there's generally one question I wanted to like mm-hmm. start with and hinge the conversation from, because I think it gets us into everything else we'll need to talk about, yeah. is this broad philosophical question, if, if machines or computers can make art. Because I think that gets us to the deeper questions of what is art, what is art to you, et cetera. Uh, but yeah, so I know it's always a broad and dumb question, but what is art? to you and what what is art versus the artist maybe is the way to ask the question right well it's one of those questions where it's it's broad and and totally unanswerable right that it's not dumb because no one has ever answered it and i think that it's one of those things where um you know we sit with the uncertainty of that i would say a lot of artists sit with the uncertainty of that by developing a personal answer and Mm. being like this is just my subjective answer and I'm just going to roll with this because, um, you know, because of the need to have something to build on in life. And so for me, the definition that I go with has to do with transformation. Mm. Um, I believe that art is an act of transformation. And I know that is, again, I'm sort of answering a vague question with a vague question. We can get further into that, but that's, that's my answer. And is it, well, okay. Yeah. So let's get into a transformation because I, I have, as a as a reader of philosophy, I this is a question that has been you know vexing philosophers forever of what is art, and I think the idea of transformation jives with my favorite answers as well. But I want to get more from it. I mean, your your recent art has been really personal. It's obviously you're going through some sort of personal transformation and putting that on the wall, literally. Is that yeah. what you mean by transformation? You know, I am, I think that what you're seeing there is where the transformation became more potent the longer that I worked. But I really think that, um, that I define the transformation pretty loosely. And how I came to that is because uh, I was very classically trained and for a long time my concept of art was very classical, mm. very, uh, you know, paint on canvas, I'm a portrait artist at heart. So the sort of underpinnings of my work are very old school definitions of, of art making. But then as I moved to New York, kind of got my mind blown by the streets, by what was happening in train tunnels and all these kind of things, like, and, you know, seeing the city, you know, working out on the street was the first impulse to make my work uh, part of of the world, right? So it felt like this thing where I was like, kind of kneading it into the, the, my life. And that question kept getting answered in different ways over and over again. So then the next thing I did was build a bunch of rafts with friends and we went down the river. And then at that moment I was like, oh, we've done all this work, uh, but what are we really doing? Maybe we could be of assistance like to a crisis if that happened. And then six months later, the, the earthquake struck in Haiti. And we, and w- with a group of people, I went and we did the rebuilding project and I, I was still calling it art, you know? And people were like, okay, well, how? what's the thread here? Like, how's this working? How is your portrait and this project of rebuilding with a community post-disaster still art? And I feel like that when you set pastel to paper and you make a drawing, you know, you're you're sort of making a chemical reaction even though you're not that you you get these elements and they come together and now you have an emotional experience for a viewer who believes that they're seeing the face of their mother um and that you you get that thing where where elements combine into a transformation and i think that that same thing can happen 
with a community after a disaster that you what do you have you have a disaster you have broken pieces of architecture you have people who are living in uncertainty and trauma and then you have a group of people who are saying hey we are we're okay this week so we're in a position to be of assistance and we're gonna we're gonna bring these things and we're gonna work together and like let's do this and and then together you create a different environment you create a different set of emotions you create hope you create arc you know and then you create the buildings and and in all of those ways there's all these little transformations happening and you know i think because i am an artist i'm like uh it's sort of like that thing of like when you when your tool is a hammer the whole world is a nail <laughs> i'm just like mm -hmm. it's all art to me it's all transformation you know um and certainly with the like you mentioned the work around um overcoming trauma that mm -hmm. process just became much more potent yeah yeah so i mean you sort of almost got to it there there's this also sort of eternal question about art about who it belongs to and once you've made it and put it out in the world, is it is it still yours? I mean, especially with your art and how it, it comes from very personal, deep investigation. Um, something like your recent piece, I, I, is it called The Canyon or is it? Maybe yeah, the, a, the installation. Well, yeah. the, the, the Canyon was the whole entire show oh, okay. and the gotcha. Medea one installation. So, so Medea, and I watched your really amazing talk that you gave at the Horizons. Oh, thank uh, you. Th it was a fantastic and really, really beautifully written. Um, it's so personal. So that one just comes from you and your own journey. It was almost, it was like a piece of therapeutic art, uh, mm -hmm. but then it's there for the public. I mean, once it's out in the public, is it, do you care what people think of it or what their experience is? Is there a right or wrong way to experience that piece of art? Um, I'm going to have to say, even though I don't want to say it, that it's not mine anymore mm. once it's out, you know, and as much as I, you know, I'll get into moments where I've had people say, oh, your community based work is, is wrong and in some way you're doing it wrong. And I'll mm. say, well, ask the people who are, ask the community what they think. You don't necessarily get to interpret that. I think you should ask the people who are the recipients of this work. And so in that way, I will sometimes kind of draw a line of being like, well, of being like, I don't know that you are the authority on this. I think that someone is the authority and that it's maybe not me or you. Maybe it's only the people who are living in a day-to-day -day way with the work itself. Um, but I think with a piece like, and I don't know that that's true, but that's like kind of, that's my gut. And then with a piece like the Medea, you know, I think even though it's this incredibly personal story, um, I just think once it's out in the world, it's, it's like anyway it's a good luck good luck trying hmm. to control that good luck trying to say what's what's mm -hmm. what's happening with it and what's right or wrong um but also there again you get into the magic of transformation right that when somebody sees that piece and when they take away what they take away like that's the chemical reaction like that's what's happening and yeah. so it's not for me to control hmm. yeah let's i, I want to really try to dig into this and i i yeah I, I hear your caveats in it as well of like, I, we don't, I don't know if this is true either. And that's your gut. I'm going to try to sort of play devil's advocate with it. If, mm -hmm. if art sort of broadly defined then is about transformations and instigating emotional journeys, semi guided by the art itself of the viewer or of the consumer of it, um, back to this, like, philosophical question is uh, of, of if you need a human to sort of craft it is it possible for something like an algorithm to produce something uh, visual or auditory that that achieves that and possibly even better than a human could do it I mean if it if it knows my emotions and can manipulate them can it not also instigate just sort of you know extreme transformations yeah i think yes mm. i i think the machines can make art absolutely hmm. um you know to be really simplistic i think that if the thing is happening the thing is happening like a saw can make a cut it makes uh, the cut the machine uh. is making the cut it's happening the thing is happening and so when i stand back and i see that the machine has combined these sounds and these elements i'm like look the proof is in the pudding the thing happened hmm. but in addition to that i think you get into this kind of regression of like, well, who made the algorithm? Mm -hmm. You know, what's it, what, who made the machine that it's playing out on? 
and I mean, <laughs> the one thing I was got a little worried about with coming on a podcast about philosophy is that <laughs> I'm a little wooey, right? I'm like a little <laughs> so, and I know that a lot of times philosophers can get super uncomfortable with that, but um. But I also get to the point where I'm like, we don't know what forces are moving mm -hmm. through the machinery, the ghost in the machine. Like, we don't know. <laughs> well, we don't know. No, but let's, I'll, I'll put a flag here. Art is wooey by its nature. So there's <laughs> like a philosopher who thinks they've figured out what art is precisely. I could, I could give you, here, I'll give you something. I'll give you something as a question of Hannah Arendt, one of my favorite philosophers. And in her seminal piece, The Human Condition, she writes a lot about art. She breaks down, I won't give her full thesis here, but she sort of breaks human activity very broadly and philosophically speaking into three categories of, uh, of work, labor, and thought or thinking is sort of the, the top one. And art sort of fits in a strange place in all these. She splits it from the notion of cognition. So she, by her definitions, it sort of necessarily is aimless and doesn't have a target that you could sort of pinpoint like cognition. So if a carpenter is going to make a chair, um, the act of making the chair has a purpose and it's an act of cognition and it has an end when you make a chair. Uh, and a skilled craftsman of sort of like a, uh, a carpenter has an, the image of the chair in their mind when they dream up this chair they want to make. And that image somehow exists only in their own mind and is this timeless, eternal kind of thing. And the moment that you start to manifest it in the world, whether through wood or even through words or speaking it or drawing it or whatever it is, you immediately, you just necessarily lose something from the ideal image to the practical thing. And in the end, the chair that ends up in the world will be somehow a little different than the ideal image in the mind. And a master craftsman just gets really, really good at collapsing that distance. And in some ways, so she sort of pins art in the same, the process of making an art of an ideal image or philosophy would call it qualia or something. Maybe for your art, it's some deep sort of emotional entanglement like you did in your recent piece about what it felt like and then somehow putting that in the world uh, a master artist someone if there is such a thing as a master artist is able to somehow tr shorten the distance between the ideal in your mind and the thing in the world um, but th the difference between that she pegs for art is that it is actually about our longing for immortality that mm. something like art and you can almost imagine the ideal image in your mind of art or an emotion or something uh, is somehow timeless and eternal. It's not in, it's woo, it just sort of is woo. It's not in the material world yet where it will die. It's actually eternal. And there's something about pieces of art that actually, ta for me for me that rings true as, as what art, the impulse for art is our longing for immortality. I don't know how that hits you, but, but, it, it, but that's I think what good philosophers might sound like when they try to do this dance of right. what the hell art actually is. So go as well as you want, because we could get into <laughs> we could get into what's in maybe in the computer and in the algorithm. So I don't know. But but to that but, but I think there's something there to to press against your last answer if there is something about um, if that's true, if that's a good sort of conception of what a good artist does, I'm tempted to want to say that there is some perfect way or some better way to make a piece of art if, if art is that abstract thing in your head than another way. And I don't know if that rings true at all to you. Um, like if somebody, if everybody visited your Medea piece and walked away thinking it was about like, I don't know, MC Hammers don't touch this or something, yeah. you would be like, wait, I did something wrong or they did something wrong. But I would be like, <laughs> yeah. no, you did something wrong. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Yes. No, of course. That's absolutely true. There are my desires about what I hope to, to come away from it. Um, you know, and I, it's, it's one of those things where I realized talking about this, that I don't think about this very often, which is strange because I spend so much of my time making art, but as we're talking, I'm getting this, I'm getting this sense that almost like that you could say art is a combination of any three. So mm. meaning like, uh, you have a viewer with an emotional experience, you have a material object and you have a circumstance in time, or you have that there's a whole bunch of things that could come together to kind of create the, the transformation and that you, 
maybe there's 50, but you only need three to come together to like, for it to click mm. in my mind as art has happened. This is, this is that thing. And I love what you were saying, the, the kind of wooey, the idea that, that almost art by definition is constantly trying to edge out of that philosophical box. Like it's almost mm. like mm. my identity is to be pushing toward this ineffable thing, which is constantly going to be muddying this conversation. I agree with that. And the impulses in the art world to, to when it feels like it's being boxed in to resist it, I think is a necessary dance that happens. I'm thinking of all like classical architecture at where there was this movement of like the perfect ratios and and where they were they were thinking that they were discovering and maybe they were and we could talk about it mathematical perfection in art and how to make perfect art and the lines had to you know line up this way and columns had to be in this specific ratio um and the art world hates that and i think for yeah. for and, and i wonder what's behind that the impulse to be to be considered a, a science i mean maybe hannah Arendt was close to it about like no this this actually cannot we cannot have a purpose on it or else or else it will inherently uh, destroy itself in the act of creating itself because it, it will always yeah. fail to be the ideal or something like that right i mean i certainly feel that way um in my own work like there are moments when you can give yourself these constraints and you can try to sort of move move toward them but there's something in the middle. Like for example, I've just been working on stop motion animation. And the mm. reason that I did that project is because like I said, I've been spending all this time doing community-based work, which has this very specific set of needs. And you really have to be accountable to community when you do that work, which means that there's heavy constraints on your, on your process. Um, and that's wonderful and you get a certain thing, but there was this other part of myself that was like, get me home take me back home and where is home home is the center where it's this totally irrational utterly unconstrained like you don't boss me around there's no deadline there's no project there's no end product i do what i fucking want like just get me into this place where in and in that place i think personally creatively it feels you feel very much like you're guided by dreams and symbols and mm -hmm. things are you know, all this kind of synchronicity is happening and that's i think why uh, art tends to feel so wooey and artists can tend to sort of show up in such a mystical way is because the relationship that i'm having to my core creative process is very uh, I don't really get it, but I just have to be like, okay, yeah, we're going. And I'm kind of holding on quite loosely. It's like this, I almost feels like that kind of Ouija board of being like, don't, don't mm -hmm. push hard, just push loosely. If you just, if you just put your hand there loosely and then, and then you can kind of get the thing to go. Um, and so, yeah, that sense of not having a goal of not having a constraint. And, you know, when you said, um, having the vision and then building the thing and then collapsing the, the distance, what I see that has started to happen lately that has been quite interesting for me is um, if in the beginning I can let the vision be very small and just start and then it's like you can keep the vision keeps coming in and so you you sort of create a landing place for the vision via the creation mm -hmm. by allowing that initial seed vision to be as small as possible and to sort of hold the process as loosely as possible um, yeah. And so then it's not just about having a vision and collapsing the distance. It's sort of about kind of setting the stage for more of the vision to come in. Hmm. Yeah. Wow. Well, I think it's time to talk about drugs <laughs> and, your, and your, because it sounds like, I mean, for me, uh, with my experience of um, on mostly psilocybin and mm -hmm. mushrooms, I've, I've recently had some very, very good experiences in relation to art, in particular music. This, podcast is basically a philosophy podcast, but I actually am way more interested in psychology and way more, and, it, and I find it to be much more of a, of a, a fertile ground to explore because we're complicated and philosophy does tend to, to gear towards reason and these abstract questions. But when you're talking about art, especially the kind of art you're doing, you're talking about the mysteries of psychology of like buried trauma and things that, that really resist rational discourse because we can't kind of get outside of them to make sense of them using our rationality and seemingly the only way to do it is is to just on you the psychic terms yeah like just just follow what they always talk about uh setting your intentions before you do these trips and then just sort of trusting it and yeah. i've done that like i've seen things that come up in my in my trips and 
they seem a little scary or I'm not sure how it relates to my intention, but you just keep remembering that little thing of like, just trust it, just go towards it. And it, and it usually pays off for me. It, it always has. I'm lucky to, to not have had a bad trip. Um, but that the process of just trusting something that you have no idea how it makes any sense is an irrational move towards it. Um, so I don't know if you want to talk about the process of creating that art and, and maybe the necessity of abandoning, abandoning your rationality to make it. Yeah. Um, so the piece itself is called the Medea, and it's uh, based around the, the Greek mythological sorceress who's most well known for killing her two children. Hmm. And my backstory is that um, both my parents were really loving, well-meaning people who had gone through serious trauma in their own lives and who were heavily addicted to heroin when I was young. And then my mom uh, remained addicted uh, to all different kinds of things throughout my life and, and struggled with a lot of mental health issues. So. Um, while on the one hand I had a really loving relationship with her, um, on the other hand, she was a terrifying person, uh, you know, because she was deeply suicidal, she would have psychotic breaks, uh, you know, tied in with her drug addiction. So it was like a pretty terrifying circumstance for a child to grow up in. And if you know, you know, kind of one of the central tenets of psychology is that the child has to preserve the relationship with the mom, mm. that you have to believe that she's good or else like you're fucked basically. So my whole life, kind of the work of believing that my mom was good, uh, you know, it took me kind of until near her death when I started to be able to, to really get down into some of the deeper truths of my life. And one thing I'd like to say, so I love psychedelics, um, but I really don't, I don't think they're a magic bullet. And I, I've had some equally mystical experiences just sitting in a chair and or uh, meditating. Mm -hmm. So so just as a caveat, like I really believe that they're part of a continuum of exploration of the unconscious that can happen in any way. It definitely doesn't have to uh, be through through psychedelics and psychedelics have only been one piece of the puzzle for me, but they've been a powerful piece. And I, I love them and I'm a huge advocate for them for that reason. Um, and so what happened is that when I was 15, I had this vision of myself as this kind of mangled switchboard. And it was this moment of lucidity. It showed up out of nowhere. And I, I kind of got it, but I kind of didn't get it. And I just put it aside for later. And then years later, I, after my mom's death, after my dad's death also, um, I had done a bunch of talk therapy, but it wasn't going deep enough. And I could just feel this like screaming abyss in me and this tension in my life. And I was like still kind of out of control of a lot of things. I was having all these rage attacks and I was just being somebody I didn't want to be. Um, and I was like, something has to happen, you know, and I was meditating and I was going to talk therapy. Um, and then uh, Gabor Mate is this doctor who was really life changing for me. He made the link between trauma and addiction for me. And he also pointed out uh, psychedelics as a possible for exploring preverbal trauma. Um, and so I decided to give it a try. And my the first thing I tried was ayahuasca. And that was the instance where the first thing that happened was tarantula mother comes up <laughs> this figure. And I'm like, fuck you. <laughs> and I, I end up going so disassociative and so crazy on this. And I'm clawing and I'm scratching. And I, I end up having to be physically restrained for five hours by five grown people. And this happens multiple times. And mm -hmm. the community is really kind. They're like, it's fine. You're processing a lot of material. And I was like, this is crazy. I can't make you guys go through this anymore. So I'm going to, I'm going to still try to do this work, but in another way. And so I went uh, looking and I found people that do one-on-one -on -one work with MDMA. And the idea with MDMA is that it gives you a little safety basket if you're dealing with trauma, which I clearly was. Um, it's reputation to be a party joke that I love you, man. Like that whole thing, if you take that into the therapeutic setting, what it translates into is like this cushion of positivity that says like, you can see what you don't want to see, like go mm. ahead and look. Um, and that's super important. And so in that work, I immediately started to uncover all of this stuff, this, this baby voice would come up and you know, this, I still don't really understand what was going on with this where I'm like, okay, who is this baby voice? Am I acting for myself? Is it legitimately uh, a child part of myself that's just been waiting all these years and can speak because, because I would listen to myself talking like an actual baby, you know, mm. grammar, syntax, the whole thing, voice, like everything. And I would say really strange things. And, and 
one of the first things that started to come up was this thing about my mom was going to kill me. And I would come out and be like, what are you talking about? But I would started to then read back through my journals, have conversations with, you know, my sister, talk to look into these kind of other things. And what I kind of found is that in fact, I'd been trying to tell myself the story of this fear that my mom would kill me for my whole life. I had been saying it over and over and over again in all these kind of coded ways. So like the psyche is trying to speak to the psyche, but there's like some connections aren't happening because of disassociation, because of this need to sort of split off unacceptable parts of the psyche. And so what was happening for me was that the psychedelics were kind of building a bridge and they were letting some of the sort of trapped aspects of myself uh, express themselves. But then, but then they would just be out and it would just be like, well, like, you know, like you'd throw a stick of dynamite in a pond and I'd be these dead fish. And I'd go, what do I do with this? Right. You know, and that's, that's one of the, you know, and, and they try to help you integrate in this, in the, the therapeutic work, but still like if you pull up a big fucking dead ass whale, like my mom tried to kill me, you're like, what, what is this? You know? And they're in, and so they're really, in my case, there was like a lot more work to be done. Mm. And so that was when I embarked on the creation of the Medea installation, which was there where I then said, okay, like, let's go back to visions I even had in teenagehood. Let's like, let's examine all the dreams I've written down for my whole life. Let's look at the various episodes that have happened and talk to my, talk to my family. And then let's get into mythology, you know, because I love those old stories. I just believe that they have this potency and that they become like a vessel and that you can, you can take that vessel and, and, and ride in it and see where it goes. And so, you know, I worked with tarantula mother. I was like, okay, who are you? <laughs> and I learned a lot from that. And then I also worked with Medea. I worked with Red Riding Hood. I did a bunch of work with these various figures of just saying, like, what are you bringing up? Um, and at the end of the installation, when the whole thing is done, what I found is that I could believe myself. I was mm. like, I'm not dead. My mom didn't kill me. So it was obviously a fear. I don't even really have memories of her attempting anything that crazy. So, so there's something kind of just in the psyche of like what was happening and there was fear and there were these moments. And so I was saying, okay, nothing happened. And yet there was this fear, but I can believe myself that I was perceiving a threat. Hmm. And, and it took a long time to get to the place where I could believe myself when I was perceiving a threat because the psyche doesn't want that. Mommy has to be safe. Hmm. Mom can't be dangerous. Yeah. You know, and what I realized is the the kind of defining moment where I was like, okay, at this moment, I do remember that she uh, became psychotic and she thought that aliens were coming to eat us and she forced us to drink alcohol to poison our bodies so that when they would eat us, they would be poisoned. But I mm. couldn't do it. I was six years old. I couldn't do it. I was gagging and crying and throwing up. And she, I remember her just looking at me like, I can't protect you. And then she drags us outside. And I think in hindsight, I was like, oh, she's going to kill us now because she can't protect us. Hmm. And so that was a moment where when I looked at it later, I was like, you know what? It probably wasn't that crazy to assume that if your dad hadn't showed up five minutes later, which he did, that we really, that that could have gone very wrong. Wow. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I mean, it was, I, I heard you tell the story and it was difficult to, I, I want to get to the part where y you maybe started to view her, uh, with a little empathy or sympathy as maybe a victim of her own trauma and how hard that is to do. I mean, it, that piece of the, of the installation where, it's sort of her, she died of lung cancer, right? And then and she, it's sort of the skeleton shell on the outside. And then on the inside, there's this lovely portrait, I think of her holding you in her arms and it looks really yeah. sweet and motherly. And so um, that seemed to be the end of that story or that chapter of her. I mean, how did, how did you get all the way there to finally yeah. I, I, you said a line that was so, in that, that talk that was so good of something that you realized that you feared and hated the same person that you adored and loved. Exactly. Oh, it's like rough. <laughs> yeah. And how many of us deal with that? I think probably yes. most of us to some level. Um, well, you know, I think that it started with Gabor Mate. 
uh, it started with this doctor who very compassionately said, no one gets that addicted to drugs that they've destroyed their life without medicating a severe trauma. Mm. And he said, it, it's not just a bad experience, it dysregulates the nervous system. It robs you of your own ability to calm yourself. So you can't calm down, you can't feel centered, you can't just chill out. You, you, you are truly scrambled at some level. And until you work with a therapist, do the work that it takes to calm down the nervous system, you're essentially, you're essentially helpless to trying to find something from outside to fix you. And so when I realized that and I understood that, I was like, oh shit, like this wasn't, because I used to, I grew up in Fox News America. I grew up in those junkies are selfish and assholes, yeah. right? In and Florida like, as well, right? That's, Florida, yeah. Yeah, so, like so somebody, extra, extra Fox News. <laughs> extra Fox News, <laughs> yeah. right? And so it was just like somebody had turned the lights on. And, mm. and then she, because I became compassionate to her and because she got sick and she knew mm. there was only so much time, she decided to tell me, hey, you're, there, it, there has been trauma because she denied it, denied it for years. And then finally she said, yes, there was a, a really horrible sexual predator in my family and that nobody was protecting me and my mom was emotionally abusive. And, you know, she just sort of let me understand what she'd been through. And, you know, and I think the thing about forgiveness, I was saying to somebody the other day, they were saying, oh, you're so good. You forgave your mom. And I was like, hey, don't forget that my mom then died. And what that means is that she she's not alive being an absolute maniac right now, which she would be doing, you know? So I, I had this forgiveness experience with her and then she was gone. And so it was like an event. And I really think that if she was still alive today, like we'd be fighting and I'd be doing another intervention and she'd be having another suicide attempt and I'd be trying to get her to go to therapy and she wouldn't be going and I'd be, you know, having all of that. But instead I had this really intense forgiveness experience it just shook my sense of reality. It shook my sense of time and space. It mm -hmm. shook my sense of how the world works. What do you think, to bring it back to the art question, obviously you have you deal with and have dealt with a lot of this trauma and it's a continual process of processing. Um, what is it about, where do you think the desire to sort of put it in public comes from? I mean, you got your start at street art, I imagine, you know, just the impulse of like, uh, putting putting your pain or or your your lens on the world literally on walls and for the world to see where do you where do you think that impulse comes from maybe in you and then maybe just in general abstractly for all artists well I'll, first i'll start really specifically and say that on the morning that i woke up knowing that my mom died the next person that i encountered uh, I, I went to the conference that i was going to i just waited for my sister to call and the next person that i met said our work is to help people tell their personal stories in the context mm. of their life's work because we think that uh it builds a, a more connected world when we do that and i was like okay i'm just gonna let this be a sign and i and i grabbed them after and i said i have stories that i need to tell um because i had been hiding them for years mm. from myself first but then also from from people who who i was sharing parts of my life with and you know and the the need to connect, I think, is all kinds of stuff. I mean, I think we want to be validated. We want to be seen. We want to believe we exist. I mean, there, it's no coincidence that artists have a strong relationship with trauma. And I think it's, I think it, that's a bunch of things. I think that there's the need to be validated, the need to be seen. There's what drives you. And then I actually think that, um, that trauma does something to your consciousness hmm. uh, that like puts a screw loose that actually allows you to be a little more fluid with what you're taking in. Um, mm -hmm. which is a weird thing to say, and I've never really articulated that publicly before, but it's something I've come to believe. One, one moment I always return to is I was like in my late teens and I was at the Van Gogh Museum in the Netherlands. And I was looking at this Van Gogh painting and I was like, just watching, you know, the way the light kind of moves through the paint, right? And I was like, I know that mind. I know that feeling when the grass hums and like the earth is, is sort of like I would get into these states where like the world would seem to be uh, kind of radiant and not still, you know? Mm. And I was like, oh my God, that's it. That's the place. I've been there he, in, and, and he's there and he's showing me and he's saying, hey kid, it's fine. You're not alone. 
I'm a hundred years dead, but I know exactly what you're talking about. And I felt loved and I was like, yeah, man, like you're a human and like you get my heart. And I wanted that. I wanted that feeling. It felt so good. And I was like, I want to give that. That's beautiful. Yeah. I think this notion of connection art as a well, it, it taps into the immortality thing for sure with Hannah Arendt of this. It's it's a um, she called it a immortal object made by mortal hands as almost mm. proof yeah. of yeah. that we are a, a special kind of creature that can even attest to that. Um, I don't I don't know if it's fair. Maybe, maybe with the machine question, it's or computer question. It's also fair to wonder or ask, given I was thinking about it when you talked about Van Gogh. Um, if animals can create art in that way, or, or if this is a specific sort of perhaps being able to create art is the defining feature that makes us human. This is another long, you know, chestnut of philosophy of what are humans and Aristotle called us the rational animal and everyone's had their own, their own answer. But I think not a bad answer is the animal that can make art. Uh, I don't, I don't know if that strikes you as true, but it, but it seems, it seems that, whatever that thing is that we're dipping into with art or trying to dip into that you felt like, Oh, Van Gogh has, has seen what I've seen or drunk from the same pool that I, that I know um, is, yeah, is almost this uniquely, like you said, he's a human and we're both humans and that we're, we're bound by some sort of deep desire. Maybe it is for immortality or for remembrance or something. Um, or or to yeah. allow you know what if art is a sort of an emergent property of a certain level of complexity and then like the ghost enters the machine right so let's mm. just say it's that and and so then let's say hmm. that a machine can make it an animal can make it the world can make it it's a thing that can just happen um but i think that even let's say that that were a definition even still i think then what happens is you get I see sort of humans as like the animal that looks at itself of like, mm -hmm. God, we're doing that. Right. That like that you get into like whatever it is that you're doing, that the, the sort of the conscious desire to do it and the ability to watch yourself do it is, you know, and I think this gets for me, I get into this with meditation. Right. So I do what I love to do, like a 10 day silent meditation every year. And mm -hmm. one of the, the ones I, I do uh, is Vipassana and in, in Vipassana, you're just you're just feeling the sensations. That's all you're doing over and over again, feeling sensations, feeling sensations. And somehow doing that day after day facilitates these shocking experiences. And it's almost like, it's almost like the, you, you get like a feedback loop. Like yesterday I accidentally entered myself twice on like a Google meetup and we're like, <laughs> things started to happen. I almost feel like that, that like something about when conscious starts to consciousness starts to see itself mm -hmm. that like, just like these other things start to happen. And I think that that's when you get into the idea of like the animal that, that makes art or like, I feel like we're kind of the animal, that, the consciousness that looks at its own consciousness mm -hmm. that like, that's kind of the, that's where I would say that we're quite, uh, interesting <laughs> yeah yeah I, I i would venture to guess that is the place where art must come from is a kind of self-consciousness i'm trying to imagine which is why i'll tell you i i i want to doubt that machines can make art i don't doubt they can move people and this is something like yuval harari writes about i don't doubt that they can manipulate human emotions probably even better than a human can to a certain degree if they can just understand them using a certain as you're, you're suggesting a certain level of complex impenetrable math that you know feels supernatural just because it's so damn hard but a computer can do it um but but they well we don't have a good definition for consciousness really but assuming they don't have something like a self-conscious experience um i I'm, i want to say maybe it's just my humanness my species is coming out i want to say that that eliminates them from actually coming from a place of making genuine art that the that art has to maybe i just like the hunter rent definition it has to actually be e even saying that your aim is to manipulate the audience is a co is cognition rather than art in her definition because then it's like oh you, we can measure how successful you've been in some way but art has to almost just be aimless and timeless for its own sake which, which again does feel like 
you you need a kind of the way you put it like a, a self consciousness and watching what you're doing in order to um break free or transcend from the the monotony of evolution and the pressures of survival and sex all the time because art art serves none of that i mean if i'm right genuine art is not like evolution wouldn't understand it really it's a way to step outside yourself and wonder what kind of animal am i what kind of world is this and then you could step back in yourself and you know sell it on the marketplace or whatever but the act of the act right. of creating the art itself when you're doing it if it's if it's something that feels truly artistic and my mind has to come from some kind of place like that and definitionally a machine so, can't do it i don't know maybe i'm just here's here's a yeah. just to give you another this is where, where my devil's advocate mind goes yeah yeah so um so when I had that experience with my mom, I was like, what the fuck is time? What the fuck is space? And what the fuck is consciousness, right? Um, and so in an attempt to kind of catch up to some of that stuff, I was doing all kinds of research on, you know, what is consciousness? And the, the thing that I found is that at the sort of far end, edge of consciousness research, there's a lot of people who are like, we don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. And we don't believe that it's materially generated by the brain. So there's this whole kind of school of thought where people, uh, the sort of radio receiver view of consciousness, where people look mm -hmm. at the brain as a radio receiver. So you can damage its ability to receive consciousness, but you you don't cut off consciousness mm -hmm. at the source when you when you break it. Um, and so taking that as an idea, like when I am making a, a piece of work, so let's say I'll start with a portrait and I'll be like, okay, I'm drawing it and I'm putting in my emotions and I'm bringing in like this person's thing. But at, at some point, what I want is for a spirit that's unique to the portrait itself to enter the room. Mm. And, you know, maybe I'm being fanciful, but what I really believe and feel in those moments is that there is a spirit that enters the piece, that if you can get the vessel right, the thing will appear. And so, and so in that way, when I think about the question of whether or not machines can make art, I sort of feel like, well, I don't know that I'm making art. Mm. I'm doing all this, that, and this and that, right? But at a certain point, something has to come in. And I'm like, well, I don't know, maybe a machine can do that. Why not? Maybe it really is an emergent property of a certain set of circumstances that is not about human volition, but is about this kind of a larger connection to the patterns that are happening in the world. And it can, that lightning can strike anywhere. That, that was great because the obvious pushback, which you did so well just there, is that you are a machine. We're just meat machines anyway. Yeah, if it's the radio receiver view and it's not emergent from us, but actually we just sort of somehow tune into it, whatever it is, my, my particular collection of quarks and the way they're dancing at the moment is just just happens to be the pattern that is tuned into the janus of the universe and so then i am now thinking that i'm emerging it but really it's just some two-way channel uh, i'm i'm totally cool with that view they're, frankly they're, every view of consciousness is crazy so they all sound crazy so <laughs> so don't don't i mean if someone thinks Thank you're crazy you. yeah if somebody's <laughs> If somebody accuses you of having psychosis of speed, just no, I'm just studying consciousness. They're all, I mean, I know, they're I all equally Everything wrong and right. <laughs> they're all crazy. And so I, I'm not going to call it crazy to, to suggest that a machine in a particular, or even an animal in a particular arrangement of quarks, if, if that materialism somehow just becomes the, the matching pattern that then channels it in, then, then, then you've done it. I mean, I, th I think we have to, just to move through the world, we have to separate ourselves from we are here and it, and it is out there. But that, the irony, as you're saying, is like the, that is the exact um, barrier and distance that usually you're trying to collapse or, or view as the illusion that it really is through meditation or through drugs is to try, is to eliminate the self and realize that the wall between yourself and the outside world is actually a, just a bit of a survival mechanism and nothing real. So, uh, yeah, I guess that's open whether machines can, yeah, if, if that's right and machines can make art, they can make art. Um, I do, I, yeah, something about me wants to push back against it. I wonder if, if a machine could ever do something like you know the the what's the famous the the uh, the famous data as piece of of the um the toilet in the uh the duchamp right Our mud. yeah duchamp's duchamp, duchamp. yeah like would a computer ever be so clever as to make <laughs> something as mundane as that like right. in order i mean because yeah, that I piece mean, only becomes art yeah can make good art might be another question or well, like that, a, that's, a certain flavor of art <laughs> yeah well answer that one if they can make 
can a computer genuinely, if that was a new kind of, I don't know, expression of, of something, yeah, can a computer make new art or good art or show us something new about ourselves that is genuine? Or maybe it could just do it accidentally. I don't know. It's like the monkeys typing um, typewriters forever, eventually giving you Shakespeare. It could happen. I don't know. I'm surprising myself by being so loose in this. I'm, I'm sort of not a very non-techie person. I'm usually, I usually don't think of myself as somebody who's defending the computers and their <laughs> art making. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, somehow, somehow I think, I think maybe it's because the, the, the older I get, the less I identify with it. But that's hmm. obviously not true. I mean, you know, the rest of the hours of my day, I'm totally in my ego and I'm totally like, no, this is me and this is my process and I'm this, you know, and that's like a gradient, right? From being like, it's all sort of happening and we're all funneling this consciousness to being like, to being like, no, this is about my life and this is about what I've been through and what I've learned and like I've synthesized this and I'm a specific place in the world and you're not gonna, you're not gonna, not only is a computer not gonna, gonna make that happen, but even a different human who'd been through a different set of circumstances is yeah. gonna make that happen. So of course I also feel that way. Yeah, I mean, your your work, the, the, the Canyon and the Medea piece feels impossible for something that is not you and has has experienced that to yeah. ever to ever create. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and that's like always what I've felt. I've always been like, we are, we are us. And if we can like somehow just hew to that uniqueness so totally, like something new must emerge from that. So, so art generally, again, I mean, we started this conversation with like this grand, what is art question? Um, I don't know if we've gotten any closer to answering it. Um, <laughs> what I've been toying with in my own, my own, exploration of this question is this notion of transcendence of evolution because um i, I want yeah i want to i don't know what this sentence means but i want to strive to um live life as a piece of art or the life process as art and by that i mean an examined life i mean the famous socrates an unexamined life is not a life worth living might be what i'm talking about here about degrading the human who doesn't make art because to me if i'm right or, or if this impulse in mind of mine means anything, that art has to spring necessarily has to spring from a place that steps outside of um, nature, as it were. Just and by that I mean the the evolutionary sort of crushing monotony of a meaningless universe that is just trying to reproduce itself, but demanding that there ought to be something more, must be something more. Then you have to step outside of it somehow and create art from that place. Um, if that's true, then I, it doesn't need to necessarily be a piece of music or a piece of, uh, you know, art, art on the wall. Life, an examined life is a piece of art that springs from the same kind of place. But a life that is that never does that, never takes time to question or to try to find its bearings in the world and is just surviving rather than living or, or questioning what survival is. Uh, maybe that to me feels like bad art or dead art. It can be entertainment for sure. Maybe we should talk about that line, the difference between entertainment and art. Um, yeah, I don't know. That's I just what, what I've been thinking. The, the evolution question, the evolution thing was that was yeah. kind of grabbed onto my brain because I remember, you know, being a teenager and trying to understand who, who am I and what am I doing? Um, and I remember one of the very earliest definitions that, that has remained, uh, you know, didn't go away. It was this sense that you know, kind of taking the um, taking the map of the way that you see tree branches, you know, the trunk, the branch, the leaf, you see that sort of branching out happening um, and feeling like that the restlessness itself, that the examination itself, that the, the sort of trying to push outside of the boundaries of what is the definition of art and so on, that that like is consciousness like pushing the leaf. It's mm. being like, eh, 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 I'm going over here. And so and so wondering if maybe we're not stepping outside of evolution, but participating in evolution, that like this is how consciousness evolves itself is by this restlessness. Yeah. Wow. Well, I don't know. I don't know where else we could. I don't even know where to wrap it up or if we answered anything. Uh, not that the show ever answers anything, but um, yeah, it's I think we're talking about there's just different language attached to all of these questions that I think we're we're still talking about the same thing, which is a 
I don't know if I want to say courageous because I don't want to pat ourselves on the back too much here, but a bold sort of facing. Well, for your, your story in particular, it does, does feel rather courageous to step towards a lot of that stuff that is just super painful. But it's a, a positive and intentional step towards unknown things and the unknown questions like consciousness. And when we in a world where we're knowing seemingly so much more or can explain so much more sort of scientifically, I think art always has to live on that boundary of what we don't know. Again, I don't know. I don't know if that answers anything, but I think it's tr it's it's art is a under it's it's been looked at by every philosopher and no one is just as mysterious as consciousness of of why we do it and sort of philosophically what it means and why we seem to need it and why imagining a world without it is seems like just you know a nightmare i like the sort of return to the idea that there's an unknown unknowableness to it and that it purposefully resists these definitions even all the definitions i just tried to put on it that yeah. i still think that its function is to remain in that un unknown space and that that maybe that's the definition after all something that we, we can't really name but some this agent of change that that continually resists definition and resists knowing, but remains this activating force in our lives. I'm gonna wrap up our conversation there with that really sharp observation by Swoon. I love it so much that I'm gonna repeat it. Maybe art is an agent of change that continually resists definitions and resists knowing, but remains this activating force in our lives. A world without art is a world which fully admits defeat to a deterministic universe and slumps along with the blind processes of evolution. Here's the catch-22 of this whole picture I'm painting and why that conversation with Spoon may have felt just as slippery as any about the nature of art. I think that the picture of a deterministic universe and of a blind process of universal Darwinism creating false, although deeply compelling illusions of self and purposeful design is true. We can't step out of the machine and become supernatural, not really, but we can always strive for that and hope for that. Art is an act that springs from this desire to find immortality, as Hannah Arendt suggested, or sidestep genetics or blind evolution to comment on the absurdity or tragedy or amazement of our situation rather than merely blindly participate in it. And because all of that is ultimately impossible, art is ultimately always futile. Yet, without it, the world truly becomes blind and dark. So what is art? I'm not sure but I think a necessary ingredient is a frustration with the realization that we are not our own causers, that we are merely parts of a grand machine governed by meaning vacant laws of physics. In season one, I mentioned the work of Wilfred Sellers, who referred to this as the scientific view of man, which seems to stand in eternal conflict with the manifest view of man. The manifest view is what he pointed to that declares that there must be something more than the machine, something eternal or free or self-caused. It's kind of how we feel just manifestly. Philosophy's job is to somehow build bridges between these two views and help them discover each other. Art, as I'm imagining it in this episode, seems to tug us towards that manifest view and away from the scientific view. But perhaps the question loosely threaded in this episode of machine-produced art is a tug in the other direction. A reminder that the manifest view of man rests on nothing but hope and a prayer in the pseudo-religious sense. If a machine can blindly play with math and generate something so beautiful that we humans believe that it must have developed somewhere outside of determined forces, then we have a major choice to make. We can acknowledge that we ourselves are pieces of machinery also blindly playing with math and call the machine output art, or insist that machines have achieved some kind of self-aware consciousness which enables them to produce this art and stay safe on our perch of specialness apart from the physical world. 
I'm now tying together notions from my two-part conversation with Keith Frankish and hinting at a forthcoming episode with Susan Blackmore, which is about memetics, which might fill in some of the gaps in this conversation. I don't know the answers to any of these questions, and I didn't even touch on the field of aesthetics and the arguments in favor of objective notions of beauty. All I know is that I don't think this deeply philosophical debate will subside anytime soon, and as Swoon suggested, perhaps that is the function of art in the first place, an agent of change that resists knowing, but activates our lives. So check out Swoon's art, it's really fantastic. Her site is swoonstudio.org. You can also see it on walls all over the world. I'm a big fan of street art, and I'd love to hear some of your favorites. If you're into that kind of stuff, I'll give you a pitch for a few others that I really adore. Inti, that's I-N-T-I, is a Chilean street artist who I really love. Blue, it's spelled B-L-U, is an Italian street artist who I was lucky enough to run into in Poland once, and he let me mix his paints in the morning. Uh, Erika Il Khan, I probably am pronouncing that wrong, is an Italian artist who does these really beautiful, intricate animal designs and pieces. Bastardio is another that I love. There's just so many great artists working in the mediums uh, of street art. So go find them and let me know your favorites. So that's it for this episode. I know it was pretty deep philosophy one. Uh, As I mentioned, I'm going to dive back into this stuff with Susan Blackmore in about a month. But next week is a really special treat. The guest is Cass Sunstein. And the topic is on his brand new book, Too Much Information, which is all about understanding what you don't want to know. That one's really fantastic, especially with an election coming up. And it's also really awesome to have a guest as influential and popular as Cass on this show, just as his book is hitting the shelves. So find me in a week. That's a siren. Still in New York. (laughs) I'm moving in about a month.